1995, Gabriel García Márquez creó en Cartagena la Fundación para el Nuevo Periodismo Iberoamericano. Tras 25 años impulsando el periodismo independiente, ético, innovador y riguroso, ahora somos Fundación Gabo. Somos Taller de Periodismo. Formamos, inspiramos, incentivamos y conectamos a periodistas de toda Iberoamérica. Somos Premio Gabo. Premiamos el mejor periodismo en español y portugués. Somos Festival Gabo. Celebramos en Medellín el poder de las historias en la mayor fiesta del periodismo y la curiosidad. Somos Centro Gabo. A partir del legado de Gabo, promovemos proyectos de desarrollo social, cultural y educativo. Somos Fundación Gabo. Con camaradería y cheveridad desde el Caribe colombiano, promovemos un mejor periodismo, la creatividad y la memoria de nuestro fundador. Todos los días escuchamos que el mundo que conocemos ya no es el mismo. Tenemos más información y más tecnología que nunca, pero persisten las desigualdades sociales al tiempo que aumenta la temperatura del planeta y sentimos las consecuencias en nuestro entorno diario. El horizonte parece incierto, pero nosotros creemos que hay un gran poder de cambio en cada decisión que tomamos, en la forma como vivimos y las metas que perseguimos. En el Grupo Bancolombia estamos convencidos de que es posible un mejor futuro. Por eso, hoy renovamos nuestro compromiso para trabajar decididamente por un propósito común. Que nos recuerde a los 30.000 empleados de la organización por qué nos levantamos todos los días. Promovemos desarrollo económico sostenible para lograr el bienestar de todos. Impulsando que las cosas pasen con prosperidad, pensando siempre a largo plazo. Para que podamos vivir con satisfacción y tranquilidad todos y nadie se quede por fuera. Bancolombia, Banismo, Banco Agrícola y BAM. Sabemos que aunque somos diferentes, tenemos mucho en común. Este propósito es nuestra razón de ser. Refleja eso que nos apasiona y lo que mejor sabemos hacer. Reconociendo que lo que nos hace sentir orgullosos de hacer parte de esta organización es la convicción con que enfrentamos los retos de la sociedad. Nuestro propósito también habla de elevar juntos el bienestar de nuestros países con más y mejores oportunidades. Empleados, colaboradores, usuarios, clientes, accionistas, todos desde nuestro rol podemos cambiar el mundo un paso a la vez, teniendo claro que un mismo propósito nos inspira a trabajar por el bienestar de todos. Nos sentimos orgullosos de decir que en el Grupo Bancolombia Promovemos desarrollo económico sostenible para lograr el bienestar de todos. Te invitamos a conversar sobre cómo podemos seguir avanzando juntos en la ruta de la sostenibilidad. Porque más importante que ganar el año es aprender. Más importante que los resultados es la forma en que los alcanzamos. Comprometidos con el desarrollo armónico de la sociedad y trabajando para hacerlo mejor todos los días. Buenas tardes. Uh, tengo que decir que el evento será conducido en inglés, pero hay traducción simultánea disponible siguiendo las instrucciones en la descripción del video. ¿Listo? Bueno. Ok, I'm delighted to welcome you to this conversation about cultural journalism in the time of pandemia as part of the program of the 8th Festival Gabo. My name is Jonathan Levi. And I'm talking to you from Rome, so buenas noches, it's seven o'clock here. I'm an occasional journalist who began 40 years ago as one of the founding editors of Granta magazine. And more recently, I'm a novelist, uh, uh, the author of several novels, including Septimania, which was recently published in Colombia by Reina Rajo. And I've run arts festivals in the United States and in Europe and participated both in the Hay Festival in Cartagena and as well as the uh, Classical Music Festival in Cartagena. And though I've never been to the Festival Gabo in Medellin, I visited your beautiful city many, many times when my eldest daughter, Rebecca, lived there for a few years 
and most recently it was at the Feria del Libro in Medellin uh, two years ago. Also, over the past eight years, I've had the honor to be the co-director of the Gabo Fellowship in Cultural Journalism, which is a fellowship in which we gather 15 mid-career journalists from around the world to, uh, to come to the Caribbean coast that was so central to the life and work of Gabo during his lifetime with the help of guest masters from Latin America and from others who are preeminent in their fields. And that's why one, years, one year ago, I had the pleasure of inviting Jason King to Cartagena as a guest master for the Gabo Fellowship in Cultural Criticism. And now Jason King is a founding faculty member at New York University's Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music, where he's an associate professor, director of global studies and director of writing, history, and emergent media studies. A journalist for publications like Pitchfork and NPR Music, as well as a musician, DJ, and producer, King is the author of the Michael Jackson Treasures, and he has been an expert witness in copyright infringement cases for Katy Perry, Jay-Z, Timbaland, Lady Gaga, Madonna, and many others. He was the host and co-producer of National Public Radio's Noteworthy, the curator of NPR and B, NPR's 24-7 R&B radio channel, and the host of CNN's original pod podcasts, Soundtracks. In other words, a complete gentleman. So welcome, Jason. Great to see you again. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Jason, by the way, is coming to us from New York. So one of the great advantages of not doing uh, the festival live with you in Medellin is that Jason and I on two different continents can join you in yet a third one. Now, Jason, when you and I last met a year ago, it was on the occasion of the Caribbean cultural market uh, down in Cartagena, where dozens of arts and music and, uh, and dance groups came together to try and sell their wares to producers from all over. Well, it's been a crazy year since then, huh? <laughs> I mean, I can't even believe it. I, I was just kind of smiling widely just to, to be here and to see you and just to think about how much has transpired over the course of the year and where we were one year ago and how much fellowship there was and kind of conviviality and how we just enjoyed each other's presence. And, uh, and then here we are, um, you know, using technology to, to produce the same type of effect. So it's, it's a strange, it's been, it's a strange year. It's been a long, strange trip. Well, uh, Jason and I are going to talk for about the next 45 minutes about cultural journalism during this past year of COVID and of social protest and what it's meant to cultural journalists. And then uh, we've got some time at the end for those of you in the audience uh, to ask a, us questions. So as we're talking along, feel free to write any questions along in the chat box and those will be uh, passed on to us. But you know, before we uh, get on to talking about cultural journalism, talk to me about this last year, Jason, in terms of you know, what sticks in your mind uh, as events from this last year. I mean, I think the obvious thing would, of course, is the pandemic, um, but it's the way in which the pandemic has changed the way that we think about the flow of information, um, how we process information, our capacity to process information as readers. Um, and as a writer, as a journalist, I've really had to think about what my role is in the midst of a pandemic. What, you know, it's, it's a noisy year. There's just a lot of information that's circulating. And so you want to think about how it is best for you to share the knowledge that you have, your ability to write and to be able to um, to communicate um, your thoughts about the time that we live in, in a way that doesn't just sort of add to the noise, but actually intervenes in a way that is meaningful and useful. Um, and of course, besides the pandemic, there's also been um, numerous protests, um, lots of which were, of course, um, sparked by the uh, tragic murder of George Floyd in the U.S. and that kind of rippled outward. But there were protests happening before that as well. Um, but of course, I think that that moment in the summer, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and you know, um, a lot of others who were tragically murdered um, in the United States created a, there was like a catalyst, right, that created this really powerful moment of global protests that I think we all had to find ways to respond to and think about. So all of that to say, I, I feel like cultural journalists at this point have such an incredibly important role at being able to help contextualize um, the events of the year, um, 
in ways that are sophisticated, in ways that are um, that represent the complexity of these events. Um, they are re more and more responsible for representing uh, diverse viewpoints, um, helping us interpret culture from an intersectional perspective. Um, and I think that's that's been emboldening for me. That's been inspiring to know that journalists' role, even as publications become um, you know, challenged by their ability to stay afloat financially and so on. Journalists, writers have become incredibly important in this moment. Yeah, I mean, as uh, as I think about it in terms of this year, I remember that when I think you and I both arrived uh, in Colombia, you arrived a few days after I did, but the night that I arrived, uh, my plane was delayed and so it would arrive after midnight because there was a curfew that was put into place in Bogota. Uh, because of the social protests that were going on there that, in fact, were following on the social protests that were going on in Chile at the time. And we, uh, you know, I think many of us felt that, well, this was going to be a year of social protests. None of us knew about this, uh, this virus, uh, none of, or if we had heard anything about the virus in China, you know, none of us thought it was going to, uh, uh, it was going to come on uh, towards us. But talk, let's let's talk a little bit for a moment about the uh, uh, about the social protests. I mean, I get the feeling that much of what was going on in Colombia and in Chile uh, was very similar to what was going on in the United States. That uh, there was unhappiness that existed before this last year, but that it seemed that all of a sudden. Uh, there was either more uh, violence on the part of the authorities or there was more awareness of violence on the part of authorities. Uh, what's your sense? I mean, you know, quite frankly, here we are. Uh, I'm a white guy. You're not. And uh, and my awareness and perhaps what's happened in this past year is that my awareness on the part of, uh, of white people has been heightened um, of various types of um, of protests and injustices that have been uh, more than obvious to the uh, community of color, both in North and uh, South America. Sure. I mean, I think it, I think we have to put it in context, right? So it, to me, it's been at least a decade of uh, what I wrote about for Pitchfork as the decade of awakening, right? So um, it's not to say that there weren't protests before, um, let's say the Arab Spring or Occupy in the uh, late 2000s or early 2010s, but it really has been a decade of mobilization, of activism, of um, political crises that have had a, have had the response of people taking to the streets to actually talk about the nature of their conditions. And of course, within Latin America, um, Haiti, Honduras, um, Ecuador, um, Bolivia, Peru, Colombia, Chile, Argentina, there have been protests in 2019, especially. But like when we look at it. Globally, if we think about Hong Kong, we think about the U.S., there, this has literally been a decade of, of, of protests and people understanding themselves to be activists in a different way than we had seen before. And not just, again, organizers and mobilizers, but everybody sort of has had to think about their relationship to activism in, in a little bit of a different way. And so people have been protesting for a number of different reasons, right? Some of which are interlocking, but a lot of it has to do with economic upheaval. A lot of it, of course, has to do with political unrest. Um, but I do think there's often a catalyzing moment. And in the US, I think that was the death of George Floyd in tandem with the way in which the pandemic operated as a kind of x-ray that illuminated these larger structural intractable issues um, that had existed in not just the US, not just in Latin America, but all around the world. Um, the pandemic shone a light on all of that and demonstrated to people um, that, you know, we need to find a way to sustain people's humanities and to be able to allow people to have shelter over their heads and to, you know, have meals on their tables and so on. And all of that came into, I think, great relief, um, you know, in, in the age of the pandemic because people realized, all right, if this happened, I don't have a paycheck. I can't actually feed my family. I can't do the things that I need to do. And so I think this year has revealed for a lot of people how tenuous their lives are. It's revealed how precarious people actually live in many ways. And that vulnerable communities are even more vulnerable 
um, when there are natural disasters or when there are pandemics that race across the world and threaten um, people's ability to just fully live and just to be human beings. And so I think that's what this year has demonstrated, um, the, the deepness you know, it's, of the it's, structural it's, issues. You know, it's it's striking and perhaps very depressing that it took a pandemic to uh, to actually do that. I mean, the um, you know the history of social protest is uh, is a long uh, is a long one, and uh, you know some might say that 1776 was the beginning of social protest in the United States. You know, others might see that the history of the United States goes back uh, a little bit further than that. Um, but that also in Latin America, that, uh, uh, you know, the journalist uh, Eduardo Galeano from Uruguay, um, who wrote Open Veins of America, which is a great book that, that forced us to look at, uh, at the Americas and the conquest of the Americas in a different type of light, um, you know, was hailed as somewhat of a revolutionary uh, piece of writing that was going to uh, somehow shape uh, not only South America, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela uh, uh, gave a copy of the book to uh, Barack Obama when uh, uh, when he entered the White House. And Galeano himself said to uh, uh, to Obama, I think that uh, uh, he said the White House will be Obama's house in the time coming, but this White House was built by black slaves. And I'd like, I hope, that he never, never forget this. Um, and yet, in a way, it took the pandemic to uh, to bring this as a reminder to uh, uh, to the American people. Um, you know, I'm you know I'm I'm wondering because there were other projects that were trying to raise these issues, issues of inequality, uh, issues of how the White House was built by black slaves uh, to the fore. Uh, did you feel that they never really sort of uh, took hold and took root? until the pandemic came along? Well, I, until I think, the killing of George Floyd. Yeah, yeah I think what the um, killing of George Floyd revealed, again, is the, like, the deep structural issues, right, that affect people and, how, and their ability to live on a, on a daily basis. So while there has been a lot of fantastic cultural journalism that has done that work of trying to actually address structural issues, I feel like people were ready now to hear about the nuanced, complex ways in which structures of oppression sustain themselves and endure. And I think that's that was a shift for me um, this year. And so um, I think there's been a lot of great examples of that and how um, journalists have actually been trying to not just address racism, but actually to address structural racism, right? Um, and to really think about the ways in which structural racism uh, is embedded into the way that people live. Um, so for instance, I think the 1619 Project um, is one of those. Um, and just for those who don't know, the 1619 Project is a project that was started by the New York Times Magazine. Um, the project creator was uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, who was a black woman who created this journalistic initiative that ultimately won the 2020 um, Pulitzer Prize for commentary. And her goal and the goal of, of, of the 1619 Project was to basically reframe and recontextualize US history by actually centering slavery and its aftermath uh, and centering black contributions in uh, the United States and globally as central right, to the American project. So normally, or not normally, but sometimes slavery is seen as a sin that happened in America or happened to America um, that is part of the past and that doesn't need further elaboration because slaves were freed, we moved on. And if you're complaining now about issues related to uh, economic inequality, structural economic inequality, et cetera, you have to deal with those issues on your own and you have to find a way to deal with them as communities, but it's not related to the past. So uh, part of what the 1619 Project was doing, I think is reframing, recontextualizing slavery and saying slavery is not a past sin, but it's a present sin. Um, and it's actually counteracting some disinformation, right, about slavery. I mean, there were textbooks that were written that were saying, you know, slaves came to the United States to get jobs, right? <laughs> That's a gross oversimplification of history, and it's just wrong. Um, so uh, what she was trying to do and what 1619 Project 
uh, was trying to do is to show how slavery resonates in the racial conditions of the present. And of course, they did this tied to the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the first um, enslaved Africans in uh, Virginia in 1619. But one of the things I, I just want to bring up about that project and why it's so important, clearly it's a 2019 project, not just a 2020 project, but it was ongoing. Right. The idea of the project is that it would be open ended and it wasn't just journalism. It was visual. It was interactive. It was multimedia. It was multi format. There were essays, symposiums, poems, uh, photographs, uh, live events. Um, it was a podcast series. It's becoming a book. I think they're also doing a series, a TV series on it. It was also collaborative. It wasn't just Nicole Hannah Jones. It was other writers and uh, reporters who were involved. And it actually ended up stirring up a lot of interest in people wanting to buy the New York Times print version, right? This online interactive um, uh, initiative. So I think of this as a kind of event journalism. It's an activist journalism and it's event journalism. That was in 2019, but I think opened up the floodgates for what was possible in 2020 in terms of uh, producing a kind of journalism that's almost like, I almost call it like rock star journalism because it's, it's like, it's polarizing. Um, but it's disruptive, right? In the way that like good rock music is supposed to be disruptive to establishment culture. It, it came in and it shook up the establishment and got a lot of people upset and angry. Conservatives like Newt Gingrich and even Donald Trump who thought it was a kind of brainwashing and, and propaganda, um, but you know, also uh, certain kind of liberal writers and historians also had a reaction to it too. They were concerned about issues of historical accuracy, um, but I think what 1619 Project did, which is really important, is it forced us to really think about who gets to tell history, who gets to frame culture, who are the people who've historically been able to do this, and what does it mean when you have different people, including Black women, who now get to reframe and recontextualize this history and actually reveal the deeper structural implications of that history. Now, it's interesting what you say in terms of it. Uh having both an explanatory uh, effect, but also a polarizing effect, uh, the 1619 Project. I was reading, I think it was even just yesterday in the New York Times, another black woman, uh, the, um, uh, the writer Ayanna Mathis wrote a very interesting piece about James Baldwin and about his uh, growing up in the black evangelist church and the way that she did. And she said that Baldwin was forged in the crucible of an America perpetually teetering on the edge of self-destruction, unwilling to heed the warnings of those who understood the immensity of the peril. The result of that heedlessness, as we've seen in these pandemic months, is quite literally death. And while I think that that's one of these kind of statements that uh, at least 100% of Americans would agree with, uh, where they might differ is on what's the imminent cause of the self-destruction. I think half of them would blame, uh, you know, white supremacism, would uh, blame racism, would blame conservatism. And the other half, you know, as you were mentioning, Newt Gingrich and Donald Trump would uh, blame liberalism. So the question is, you know, is all of this stuff now coming up to the fore? Um, is it something that uh, can be solved? And where is the, uh, where is the place of, journalists in terms of trying to make sense of this polarization? I mean, I, I would turn that question to you as well, Jonathan, to, to ask what you think. I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on, on, on this? Well, I have, you know, I have, I have a little bit of ambivalence. I mean, there's now a, um, you know, I think that within the frame of COVID that we're doing much less of what journalists generally do, which is go out and see stuff because we can't we're more, more isolated. I mean, to the extent that we believe that journalists do three things, which is they observe, they analyze, and then they finally communicate uh, their results. Um, it feels to me like we're spending a lot more time analyzing stuff and explaining, and that there's a lot more of what uh, I think in your and my discussion we've called uh, explanatory journalism. And there's you know something very good about that. I think a lot of people turn to the newspapers, they turn to the uh, graphs that they see in the newspapers, and they ask journalists, explain to me what this means. You know, explain to me today, Britain just started uh, giving COVID vaccines today. Is it safe? Someone tell me, is it gonna be safe in the United States? How often is it gonna protect me, blah, blah, blah. 
explain, explain. But personally, I feel that sometimes journalists get themselves uh, tied up in explaining and that sometimes people don't want to be explained to. Many people have, uh, have said that Hillary uh, Clinton lost the election in 2016 because she seemed like one of those Eastern managers who goes out to Detroit to the auto plants and explains what they've been doing wrong all these years. You know, all these uh, guys who have been working and know the, you know, the auto industry very well. And no, the experts are gonna come out and explain to you what's going on. So I think it's, uh, I think we're finding ourselves in a, in a difficult, uh, in a difficult moment. Also, because as soon as we explain in a way, we, uh, we expose our prejudices. You know, we let people know where we're coming from and, uh, you know, it's very hard to convince them that we're coming from some kind of middle line in which we're taking a neutral position and just giving them facts. But I, I can't imagine this year without explanatory journalism. And so what I, what I mean by that is like uh, uh, reporting that is helping uh, readers trying to make sense of the world because the world has become more complicated, more nuanced, um, uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of information, there's information overload out there. And so it becomes journalists' responsibility to try to help readers know and understand government and policy and technical issues and so on. But this is not just about the political world, this is also happening in all kinds of cultural journalism. So even in music journalism, for instance, Vox has its discussions about how music is made. Song Exploder, the podcast, right, is really about explaining and deconstructing songs themselves and explaining to people how they're made. And now it's become a Netflix series. The rise of music documentaries, uh, there's, there's the proliferation of them is also about explaining things that people would otherwise find mystifying or complicated. But I, for instance, this year have turned to The Atlantic for their exceptional coverage on the pandemic. Um, and I think of that journalism as, as fantastic explanatory journalism because the writers are able to take a lot of information that's coming at you and put it in a very succinct way that helps you understand the issues. Um, and I think this is incredibly important in an age of disinformation. I think we can't pretend like we don't live in an age in which there's deliberate strategic disinformation that's happening, not just in the US, but in places like Brazil and, uh, you know, where the governments are deliberately uh, trying to disinform um, the populations about um, really important public health issues. Um, and so that's one thing that journalists are doing. And I also think that journalists have been have become responsible for taking uh, topics that had formerly, be, formerly been uh, relegated to the academy or to the university. So topics, for instance, related to race, like intersectionality, or looking at the structural machinations of sexual abuse in the Me Too era. A lot of this conversation had been happening at um, black studies departments in the US or at gender studies departments and so on. And that language has, has, has become much more mainstream. And if you go to Twitter, you'll see people talking about misogyny and structural racism in ways that we wouldn't have seen maybe 15 years ago. So journalists have also become important for helping explain complex issues related to identity and related to, to, to politics that I think is essential right now. Um, so that part of the explanatory thing, I think, is meaningful. Well, I, I think there's one thing that cultural journalism also does very well, which is by using the excuse of culture, you know, going, talking about something that you find in the back pages of the newspaper, that somehow you can get ideas around to people uh, that they think would normally be on the front pages and persuade them of it, uh, which is awfully hard persuading people these days because I think people go to the news, they go to journalism in order to reinforce what they believe already. Uh, and that's why we've got this war of facts. I mean, I was just, um, uh, I was just reading a novel by Colin McCann, The Paragon, um, about a Palestinian father and an Israeli father who both lose their daughters. And there's an extraordinary scene in which the Palestinian, while he's in uh, prison for seven years, happens to see a film about the Holocaust. And all of a sudden this changes everything about, uh, about what he thinks. I think that's, you know, a wonderful moment of fiction 
<laughs> it seems entirely like fiction. I mean, that was very you know, fictional. Yeah, you know, he's uh, tornadoes picked him up and he's gone over the rainbow and he's in Oz. Um, you know, people are just not. You know, if you hit them straight on, they're not changing their minds. But if you go through the back door, they might uh, they might listen. And there's actually there's a piece that um, uh, there's a piece of yours that I read about the two C shuffle about Drake. Uh, this is fine. Uh, this is slide. The two C slide. Sorry, the two C slide. You know, this is what happens when the dad tries to uh, pretend he knows <laughs> what he's talking about. Uh, but it's uh, but it was a fantastic article uh, because the things that you talk about it, for for people who don't know, and I think I was the only person on earth who didn't know about the two C slide uh, before uh, before I watched the video and read Jason's article. Um, you know, it's a uh, it's a song that Drake uh, uh, video that he recorded and then videoed in Toronto in his 50,000 square foot mansion, you know, essentially alone. And it's as much a, uh, it's a film about isolation. We see isolation as he moves through a, uh, uh, through his house that looks that it, like it could be uh, a suburban mall or a museum or who the hell knows, but a house, how many of us have seen a house like this? And there he is, uh, not only all alone, but dressed in a hoodie and with a mask up to his face. I think, as you mentioned, uh, you know, if someone had just come along, they would have pulled a gun on him and said, what are you doing in this house? You know, that you're robbing this place. And that in the course of your article, Jason, uh, what I found fascinating was that you were able to do what I think, um, but as a journalist, what a lot of other academics would do, which is talk about what is the place of, or what historically has been the place of the black male, both outside and inside? What does outside and inside mean to them? You know, for most of us, quarantine and isolation, uh, for most of us who aren't uh, people of color, quarantine and isolation are a pain in the ass, but they don't, they're not weighted uh, with all the freight um, that you bring up. And so, you know, there's a sense that cultural journalism of this sort can in fact, uh, you know, find this moment, you know, especially when we're in quarantine and we have lots of time in our hands to watch uh, videos like the Tusi slide and uh, uh, and read articles to somehow have our minds educated. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I was just talking about information overload, but it's also just been a really bad news year. There's just such bad news that you're having to deal with on a constant basis. I don't know if other people feel this way, but I, I have to sometimes shut the TV off. I have to turn off my phone, I can't process any more information. And one of the things people do is they escape to Netflix or wherever else to, to try to, you know, to, to get away from the news. But it's, it, it was interesting to me that in popular culture, particularly in TikTok, if I was looking at popular music, there was a, a real emphasis on dancing this year. And so what I wanted to do in writing this piece that I ultimately, I wrote for the um, Het Nui Institute in Rotterdam for their um, music video series. I wanted to be able to write a piece that um, explained where we were and how we are living now and how the way that we are living now has, has changed in the age of the pandemic and in the age of racial justice protests that have gone global. But to do it through the lens of this four minute, three minute music video by Drake that to me contains the multitudes. I watched that video about just Drake dancing in his $100 million home in Toronto. And it made me think, I see how culture is shifting just in that video, right? So there's a connection between the idea of making a viral video, and it became a huge video this year that everybody was dancing to and made their response videos, making a viral video and living in a moment of a viral pandemic, right? And he made the video for this pandemic moment, wanting us to move in our homes at a time in which certain kinds of movement has become restricted globally. And so that seemed to me to be an interesting kind of juxtaposition or maybe an irony in the culture that I wanted to kind of work out and think about through the lens of Drake. And then to think about the relationship between indoor and outdoor, because so much is happening in his home. And as you mentioned, for a black man to be in his home with a mask on uh, and a hoodie dressed in this particular way, evoked all these images of black criminality that have been so problematic and so freighted. And so it struck me that he was playing with those images at a time in which the idea of certain kind of black people going outside is freighted, right? So thinking about um, somebody like George Floyd being killed outside, 
right? But also somebody like Breonna Taylor being killed inside her home. And so the very meaning of home for people in an age of um, income inequality, wealth inequality, tied into racial inequality, gender inequality, it struck me that a lot of this was being illuminated in, in Drake's video itself. And so I think there's a lot of work that um, cultural journalists can do to look at aspects of our culture, particularly popular culture, film, movies, et cetera, and to see the ways in which those um, works of popular culture are resonating with the larger issues that are happening in the culture politically and socially and otherwise. Mm -hmm. Thinking of the way that film is coming to us uh, these days, especially now that you know most movie theaters are closed and we're just getting film uh, you know, through streaming, uh, one of our students for this year's, uh, Becca Gabo, uh, is a Chilean uh, film critic and told me that uh, I wrote a wonderful article actually about uh, Pedro Lemebel, who is a uh, uh, who died about five years ago, who was a gay censored uh, writer in Chile, and a film was made of uh, one of his novels, My Tender Matador, and it just showed up, you know, on the internet. Didn't have any kind of theatrical release, and was seen and sold more tickets than any other film that had been made in Chile in the past, uh, you know, ten or twenty years. Um, a film about a subject that essentially had been censored in high schools, his books had been censored, had been pulled out of a number of high schools because of uh, the gay content. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, as we talk about, um, you know, this year of pandemic and this year of social unrest, is there a silver lining to being stuck uh, inside? Are we, seeing, uh, are we seeing more interesting art come out of, uh, out of the pandemic? Uh, than we did before, things that are more thoughtful? That's a good question. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I have a, a, a single answer um, to that. I think there's been a huge amount of really fascinating work, some of which was created before the pandemic, but magically kind of resonates with the pandemic. One of the biggest global pop albums of the year is Dua Lipa's Future Nostalgia. And it's a dance album um, that was made before the pandemic, but released in the spring. Um, and most people would say, well, what's the point of a dance record? Like, uh, you know, kind of looking back to the old days of disco and so on um, in this moment, but it's incredibly meaningful uh, at a time in which people are in their homes and in which artists are mostly doing work out of their homes in which journalists are doing work out of their homes. Except, um, except so, let me ask you, let me ask you yeah. a question about, about that, uh, about that album, because again, you brought that to my, uh, to my attention and I think it's fun, but I then saw Dua Lipa has been actually quite active as a social activist and, yeah. uh, you know, for, um, you know, I would say the kind of causes that we like, you know, the left wing causes or reasonable causes. Uh, but do you think we'd like we'd like the album so much? We dance to it so much. If, let's say, she was a pro gun activist and if she was a white supremacist and if she was, you know, in other words, how much how much are our uh, our feelings about culture now dictated by where uh, artists lie on the political spectrum? Wow, I mean, I think very much so. I think, um, you know, again, I think the events of this year have made people um, exhausted and fatigued, right, with certain viewpoints that seek to reduce or circumscribe their humanity. So, you know, the, a good example of this would be the Harper's letter. Um, and for those who don't know, this was a letter um, that was published on Harper's Magazine. It was uh, spearheaded by Thomas Chatterton Williams, the writer. And basically uh, this open letter, it was called a letter on justice and open debate. Um, the point of it, it was to defend free speech, right? To denounce cancel culture um, and to say that cancel culture, the idea of just no platforming somebody or, or um, canceling them out of the culture because of their political perspective is really a problem of liberalism gone wrong, right? And you have to end cancel culture. And the way to do that is to stop liberals um, from expressing themselves in a way that is about trying to cancel people. And so they had, what, 153 kind of very important elite cultural figures, including many, many important journalists and writers. You had David Frum, um, David Brooks was in there, uh, Margaret Atwood, fiction writers, uh, Grail Marcus, the music journalist. Um, 
uh, J.K. Rowling, um, signatory who has been on record as being kind of anti-trans. Um, so to me, you know, we're at a point where there's this huge polarization, especially around the issue of cancel culture and call out culture. And journalists have been, cultural journalists are at the center of that in a lot of ways. But the issue I had, I, I mean, Jonathan, do you, you, you were aware when the letter came out and all of that, what were your thoughts? Sure. Well, my feeling, I've, I've had, shall we say, evolving feelings about this because, uh, you know, essentially I'm, given any uh, particular argument, I think that argument should be one that's, uh, that's open to debate. We should be able to have a free interchange um, of ideas. As I started to think about that letter, the problem was is that the letter didn't speak about anything in particular. It just spoke about a general uh, type of cancel culture that was going on. And uh, at the same time as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about some of the ads that were uh, that were going on that essentially, you know, I forget ex exactly how they went, but they said, you know, that for black people in the United States, you know, when they protest, when we protested, you told us to calm down. You know, when we kneeled, like Colin Kaepernick, you know, you told us that we were unpatriotic, you know, when we did this, so that I saw, ah, okay, put these two things together, and does the letter, the Harper's letter, come off as yet again another one of the things in this type of uh, in this type of sequence? In other words, that people are protesting whether they're black or whether they're gay or whether they're, you know, whatever their positions are, and they're saying you're trying to deny us the right of protesting. This is another form of protest. Fine, you know, stop our protests, but change something. Uh, Systemic in the culture uh, before you're go before you're going to do that, and yeah. uh, and that's what struck me as being the most problematic is that in any discourse, and I think in a way journalists have the um, responsibility to try and be as specific as possible, to not try and be general. That when you're general, what happens is it starts to look like um, you know you've got some type of axe to grind as opposed to you're talking about a specific issue. And sure. that was what, that's what bothered me about the Harper's letter, uh, was that I mean, reality. For me, I mean, it was that the writers and the signatories on, on that letter, I mean, I think they're actually just misdiagnosing the problem of cancel, cancel culture, because what they're saying is that online cancel culture, and let's be clear, they're talking about, in particular, Twitter, right? And the rise right. of, of um, like black Twitter, as it's called, right? The idea that there's like separate but equal Twitters. <laughs> but this idea of this online cancel culture is disrupting uh, free conversation, free speech through silencing. I mean, I think that's a kind of gaslighting, right? Because they're missing, they're basically claiming themselves as victims of this liberal online cancel culture. But cancel culture has always been a tool that people in the establishment, people who actually have official platforms, they've always used cancel culture uh, and silencing as a tool. So like blacklisting, right, was a form of cancel culture. Um, not allowing people to fully express themselves and silencing and suppressing certain viewpoints has been cancel culture. The New York Times, for instance, didn't talk about AIDS in the 1980s until many, many years after uh, so many gay men had passed away. And so, um, you know, that's a form of sort of canceling like a social death, right, of certain kinds of vulnerable communities. Um, and this became an issue also this year um, with Barry Weiss, the journalist and opinion writer for the New York Times, um, that she quit the New York Times um, in July 2020 of this year um, because she claimed that the Times was muting and silencing voices. And she, again, was blaming uh, liberal call-out culture for it. So she was claiming herself as a victim of workplace discrimination, having working in a hostile work environment. She was being bullied. And then I think it was interesting that in her letter that she wrote that was a critique and why she walked away, she said that Twitter has become the ultimate editor of the New York Times. So the question I have for you is like, what does it mean to do cultural journalism in an age of black Twitter, in an age where social media has become incredibly powerful, there's a court of public opinion and masses of people are gonna hold you accountable for your statements. People are going to hold you accountable for your retrograde politics, right? 
Well, you know, I thought about this the other night. Uh, uh, my wife and I watched uh, this new movie, Mank, uh, the David Fincher movie about uh, about Herbert Mankiewicz, who wrote the script for Herman Mankiewicz, who wrote the script for Citizen Kane. And, uh, you know, and, you know, one of the ballsiest scenes in the entire uh, in the entire movie is a big speech that Gary Ullman as Mankiewicz has speaking to R William Randolph Hearst uh, in a drunken uh, you know, sort of court jester type of moment, but a uh, but a big speech in which he's talking truth to power, um, and he pays for it. Having seen Mank, we went back and we watched Citizen Kane, which was made in 1942 by Orson Welles, which is the same type of story. This ain't news. You know, this has happened for a long time. You know, the idea that the New York Times, in Barry Weiss's mind, was some type of uh, some kind of golden symbol of, um, you know, of wisdom. Uh, it's just wrong and misguided. I think the uh, I think newspapers have been owned by uh, by people who have opinions, and there are editors who have opinions who will guide it. And it may go this way, it may go that way for a time. Uh, as a journalist, you have a right as a um, as a journalist to quit or to work for a newspaper, whatever you want. But ultimately, I think that, you know, in the same way that the doctor takes a Hippocratic oath, you have a, uh, a duty to stay true to what you believe is the, uh, is the right thing to write. And that ultimately is where, you know, I come down. Barry Weiss had a right to quit the New York Times. Fine. I don't care about that. Anything after that, however, I find you know, I t sometimes tell my writing students if they get a rejection from a publisher, uh, stop reading after the word no. You know, it just says no. You know, stop whining. You know, they, they're going to try and explain and you're going to whine. Let's just cut that out. And that's what I would just uh, uh, I would just say. If she wants to write a thought out piece about the problems with Twitter, fine. But don't. Uh, um, but if you tie it to your own particular peeve, people are going to really stop listening to you. But it also struck me that it the, the thing that ties the Harper's letter together with what happened at the New York Times, by the way, which is like, to me, part of what's going on in 2020, right, is not, it's also, we're getting a peek at the structures of these newsrooms themselves and who has power, the power relationships. Like that's something relatively new in terms of the amount of information that we have about what actually, like the culture of these of these newsrooms. But um, it struck me that her critique is really about her concern that she's actually losing the power to define and, and frame culture, right? That she's losing her ability to become a gatekeeper. Like, how can I use my platform to tell people what is good or bad in culture if you have black Twitter doing the same? So it's really become about a demo democratization right, of like gatekeeper culture, which was formerly just about establishments and people who had the ability to do this work kind of silently, right? They were just like, I mean, even like somebody like Frank Rich at the New York Times, you know, used to be able to open and close a, a show in the 1980s just by with one review, a Broadway show. Mm -hmm. So that era is ending. Well, this, this raises a much larger uh, question, which, you know, maybe is the topic for our next conversation, which is, you know, what's the role of journalists in the age of Twitter? Uh, that, you know, I think we started off by saying that journalists are looked to now to be explainers because there's so much stuff out there. There's so much, uh, so much on Twitter, so much on Facebook, so much being put out on social media. Uh, now there's even TikTok journalism uh, that, you know, somehow you look to experts to make sense of all of this. And the experts still have to be, have to be journalists, uh, which leads me to just one other uh, thing, because when you, uh, when you came down to Cartagena, it was uh, thanks to a, an initiative um, that I think was long overdue by a group called Critical Minded to encourage more uh, journalists of color, uh, cultural journalists of color, uh, specifically in the United States. But one that I, it's a message that I hope resonates also in Latin America, because I know a few years before when we were doing a, uh, a program on the Afro-Caribbean culture in, uh, in the coast, in Latin America, that I asked my friends within uh, the Fundacion Gabo, 
you know, can you help us find a guest master of color in Colombia? No. In South America? No, there isn't one. And I thought, okay, you know, someone's got a lot of educating to do. Maybe there really isn't anybody and they, we need to educate uh, more journalists of color, or maybe we just need to educate ourselves so that we're more in contact with journalists of color. Um, and perhaps, you know, just going back to Barry Weiss, maybe this will be the good, uh, the silver lining in that cloud, which is that this type of, uh, you know, talking about the Harper's letter and about uh, cancel culture and about her response and this idea of black Twitter or whatever, will rate, will bring something out and that there will now be a public discussion um, and perhaps a, you know, a greater awareness of, of how we receive our journalism. I think, uh, I now, think so for sure, yeah. Sorry. Now we've got a few minutes left. I don't know whether um, uh, there are any questions coming from our uh, from our audience out there. Um, oh, okay, good. No questions. Everyone has been uh, entirely on our side. They understand it. But let me ask uh, um, you know another thing, which is that as we're now looking as cultural journalists at the cultural scene. Are we seeing things that are really helping us from the art point of view? Pop music happens fairly quickly. Are you seeing anything from the film side? I've seen, uh, you know, recently there was something from the New York Times called the Decameron Pop Project, which uh, was a series of fiction writers, including Advisha Danticat and Margaret Atwood, who wrote stories trying to make it like the Decameron, like Boccaccio's Decameron stories written during a plague. Um, and I felt, no, this is much too soon for people to write anything of, uh, of quality about the pandemic. Um, are you seeing anything uh, you know, happening in terms of the film world or uh, in terms of the pop music world that is, uh, that is able to confront it or are we, or are we too soon? Um, I think there's been some stuff. I mean, I think it's a little bit too soon um, because to me, some of the, the best albums of the year are the ones that were made before the pandemic hit um, that were then released and just resonate with issues related to the pandemic and protests and so on. Um, albums like Dua Lipa's record, uh, Moses Sumney's Gray is a pretty fantastic record, Fiona Apple's Fetch the Bolt Cutters, which was largely made in, in certain kind of isolation um, prior to the pandemic. And so therefore, the, it resonates with ideas about res, uh, isolation that are relevant to the era of the pandemic. Um, but increasingly we're seeing more and more, more work that has been done or created during the pandemic, but it doesn't, off, doesn't always um, address the issues of the pandemic in an outright or explicit way. And I think we're still a little ways off from that of people being able to really think about the ways in which um, the contemporary moment has impacted how people think and move through the world and, and, and those sorts of things. We'll probably see more of that um, to come. But I think of all the kind of emergent models that have happened during the pandemic. So for instance, um, on Instagram, um, there was Versus, right? Which was the um, uh, kind of battle between hip hop producers that was started by mm -hmm. the producer Timbaland and Swiss Beats, where they would play their music um, and sort of battle, quote unquote, battle each other, symbolically battle each other. And this generated a huge audience. Um, each, you know, e once a month or whatever it was, um, they would do other artists. So they had Gladys Knight and um, uh, Gladys Knight and Patti LaBelle, for instance, did one. Um, and this attracted, I mean, millions of people to watch. And Apple uh, has since picked it up and now it's become more kind of an official thing. Um, but this is a, a model that would never have existed prior to the pandemic. If anyone from the music industry had said, you know what I think is gonna generate millions of views, Gladys Knight and Patti LaBelle sitting on chairs, playing their music for each other and talking, it would never have happened. That's something that's very, very specific to the nature of the pandemic. But let, and me, ask started, you, yeah. but let me ask you, Jason, as a, uh, as a producer as well, who's making the decision for this to happen? Because, uh, one of the things I think that many people have hoped, I know in the theater community, uh, um, within small regional theaters, but I think also on Broadway, uh, there's been a clamor for more representation by, uh, by people of color, by 
in the decision-making process at the managerial level, at the producing level, not just in terms of, uh, you know, faces on the stage. Um, also in Hollywood, you know, there's been that feeling that it's not just how many, uh, how many black actors and actors, actresses or Asians have nominations this year, but how many studio heads, uh, you know, who is making the decision. And right now uh, that Broadway is dark, let's say, you know, I've been waiting and talking to friends of mine, both in the unions and in the producing side, you know, to hear about how they're going to rejig Broadway so that they can finally come back and not charge a thousand dollars a ticket and, you know, deal with issues of, uh, of inequality there. And I don't see any movement whatsoever. Uh, but, you know, I'm wondering when you give this example, uh, are things changing within the pop music industry? Uh, is there going to, be, or do you need to have more, uh, do there need to be more managers and producers uh, of color at the top? I mean, a hundred percent. And I think people have started have definitely been having those conversations in music. Um, there's a few initiatives. The show must be paused initiative started by two black women uh, executives in the music industry to try to address the histories of structural racism that have dominated the music industry for a long time. The Black Music Action Coalition is another organization um, that formed in the wake of what happened with George Floyd to really um, press record labels and music companies um, to address their own complicity and relationship to racism. Um, so there's initiatives like that uh, that are happening and that are ongoing, um, but there's also all kinds of other things that are happening in the culture. So for instance, I don't know if you've been reading about the fact that people have been trying to, um, or have been using um, TikTok to create to recreate every scene from the movie Ratatouille, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I think is like, that's something that's like an emergent thing that has come out of the pandemic and come out of this moment, right? Is people um, can't go to Broadway, but they're finding ways to recreate the feeling of Broadway in their own way using technology. And that's happening across the board. That's definitely happening in music where live stream concerts have become the only way for a lot of artists to be able to reach their fans. Um, and so clearly there's a kind of top down um, process where that's happening with artists like Dua Lipa and Billie Eilish and so on doing very formally constructed, produced, you know, uh, high production value live stream concerts. But then there's also just people on Instagram who have risen um, to the top just by going direct, right? And going on Instagram live and just doing concerts that way or Facebook Live or YouTube or whatever else. I can think of this uh, in terms of my own work that I do. Um, I started a pop-up series um, this summer with NPR Music uh, in which I would just interview uh, music celebrities that interested me. People like Moses Sumney um, and others, um, Dua Lipa I interviewed. And uh, this series was in relationship to uh, the pop conference, which is produced every year out of the Museum of Pop Culture in Seattle. But since it didn't happen this year physically, we decided to just kind of impro improvise and put together a pop-up series. And so this literally just meant me sitting in my living room talking to superstars in music <laughs> about can their you, work. Can you monetize something like this, Jason? I mean, in the sense that, uh, is this a way for new producers uh, who don't go through the system uh, to be able to make a living and to be able to sign artists and to, uh, or at least be able to make money off of uh, uh, off of music and make money for the artists as well who aren't uh, giving concerts. I mean, I think something like Versus is an interesting model where it wasn't about the economics. It was just really two producers who are friends who wanted to battle each other online and have people watch. Um, Teddy Riley, uh, the legendary producer of artists like Michael Jackson and others, uh, got together with Babyface to do the same thing, the legendary R&B producer. And now it's become something that's monetizable. They created a business structure around it. But at first, it was just a kind of emergent model um, of people just getting together. Uh, D-Nice, the DJ, um, started doing DJ sets online and then, you know, people started watching and gathering on Instagram and suddenly a million people were watching and he's, son he's since elevated himself as a major um, star in the world of DJing. Um, Louis Vega, the legendary um, record producer and DJ uh, from the group Masters at Work, um, does these lockdown sessions on a regular basis and has just generated a huge fan base doing online DJ concerts, you know, this we would never have seen this before. So 
I'm just emboldened and fascinated by the rise of all of this culture that's happening. And yet at the same time, deeply concerned about people's artists' ability to sustain themselves economically. Uh, because again, the pandemic has demonstrated to us how precarious artists live, just one, you know, check away from not being able to to feed themselves. It's a very mm -hmm. strange time. Yeah, I think we've still got a, a minute or so for a couple of questions. We had uh, Douglas Portati asked um, uh, for you, Jason, that uh, he wants to know about woke money, pink money, black money, artists that try to take a ride on social issues, but when the real fight starts, they hide themselves. What do you think of them? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I wrote a piece for Pitchfork this year during the pandemic on the changing role of artists in, in popular music um, as it relates to um, to the pandemic and as it relates to the um, racial justice protests that we saw in the US in June, talking about the ways in which artists are changing. And I was inspired to do that because the pop music star Janelle Monet had created a Instagram post where she said, I wanna let you know I'm not a real activist, even though she's had a long history doing activist music. She said, I'm not a real activist compared to what activists who are part of social justice organizations and who have really been doing the work on the ground, activists, organizers, mobilizers, they're the most important people. And I wanna shine some light on them. So I thought this was interesting that you were seeing a trend where artists are actually taking a backseat to activists, to organizers, to mobilizers and saying, let's support them. My job as a pop music artist is to amplify the work of progressive social justice organizations, but to not put myself in the front. And that's different than what we saw, let's say, with Live Aid in the 1980s, where artists were sort of leading the charge, right? Um, and there is a history of, of artists who have been organizers, who have been mobilizers, people like Paul Robeson and Harry Belafonte and others, but it's a kind of minor history. For the most part, we've had artists like Bono of U2 and so on, who have been the stars, who have been you know, the political figures, um, you know, pop music stars as political figures. And increasingly, you're not seeing that. You're seeing people turning over their Instagram accounts with their 2 million fans, 5 million fans, 10 million fans, turning it over to scholars, to activists, to organizers, to do the real work. So that said, um, Douglas, to answer your question, I think that we do, there is this whole notion of activism as fashion. And we saw this in the summer, right, with corporations in the aftermath of George Floyd that would like put up a black square on their Instagram accounts or like write a slogan, but then do nothing more. <laughs> and so, and artists have done the same thing. Um, you know, I see that activism is big, so I better become an activist. And I also better start um, saying the things that my fans are likely going to want me to hear. So I think of that as activism as fashion. But at the same time, audiences are increasingly holding artists accountable for doing more than just making a statement. What are you actually doing? How much money have you actually given? I remember um, uh, Virgil Abloh, the founder of um, you know major fashion company and creative director behind um, Louis Vuitton, um, had given had donated some money for social justice causes, for racial justice causes. But I think he gave a very small amount, like fifty dollars. And this guy's you know he's got millions and millions of dollars. And his fans went after him and said, "How come you're not?" putting more money out there, right? Like people are holding people accountable for their commitment to these issues um, in a way that I think is really interesting. And again, very different than what we've seen before. Jonathan, yeah, do you want to add anything? Uh, well, no, I mean, I'm just, uh, you know, the dog in the manger, just uh, figuring that people are going to want to uh, see something for their buck as well, that uh, they're not only going to want to see their stars uh, you know, give money to these causes, they're going to want to see these causes actually make things better. And, uh, you know, I think this is one of the things that we're looking towards after January 20th, everyone's going to expect uh, that instantly everything is going to be uh, much better when we have a new administration. Uh, in the same way that, um, you know, if we have more black faces, if we have a black, uh, you know, Secretary of Defense, that all of a sudden, uh, you know, you know, all war is going to stop and uh, and uh, the police will see that this is the uh, the way things are at the top of the chain and uh, will be nicer to people of color in the United States. And I think that, um, you know, fans who are expecting these things of their uh, of their stars are perhaps going to be in for a rude awakening. Um, and that the as you say, the quieter activism that we had in 
in earlier times. Not that Harry Belafonte, I would say, was uh, was was quiet. I mean, he was extremely active. Or Joan Baez, who marched in uh, in Montgomery with James Baldwin, or you know, any number of uh, you know Woody Guthrie with his guitar that had written on it, "This guitar kills fascists." Um, you know, we're living, uh, and perhaps this goes back to what we were talking about with cancel cultures. We're living in an age of heightened expectations uh, and immediate gratification, and uh, uh, life don't happen that way. Um, yeah. And, and, and uh, if, you, if, you, if you say nothing, some like if an artist doesn't say anything at this point, then that's uh, evidence of their complicity with oppressive culture. It's like so that that happened to Taylor Swift, for instance, where you know she was she didn't want to face the same um, consequences that the Dixie Chicks had faced in country music, where they spoke mm -hmm. out about George Bush in the early two thousands, around two thousand three, and they were canceled. In the culture, radio mm -hmm. wouldn't play them. Labels, um, you know, were no longer interested in them. The country music industry uh, decided to cancel them and try to eradicate them from the culture, but they came back, of course. Um, so Taylor Swift, as one of the biggest pop stars of the last ten years, did not want to suffer that same fate, and so she decided um, to uh, basically be apolitical in many, many ways. But then she decided she had to say something because by not saying something, it looked like she was complicit with the worst abuses of the administration. Well, you know, in a way though, you can't blame her. If you look, uh, if we look at the history, let's say of the last 40 years, um, in my mind, uh, the two worst presidents that we've had in the United States um, were people, uh, were cultural figures. You know, one was a movie star and the other one was a reality TV star. And uh, so we might be forgiven by, uh, you know, or we should look at ourselves as a culture that looks to our uh, to our stars as being people that we should look up to uh, for political answers and for social answers as well. And maybe, you know, just make them, let them make good art and what they do on the, on the side. I mean, this is a little bit of a devil's advocate position, but, uh, you know, I worry. And I'm not the first one to worry. If you look at uh, Day of the Locusts by, uh, you know, back in the 1920s, you know, we've looked uh, we've looked to our stars and we've asked them to do too much uh, for a long, long time. Um, and that, that's that's been a major change recently. And I and I but I do think um, you know people are thinking more about how their celebrity can be managed, how it can be used, how it can be deployed in ways that they they wouldn't have deployed it before. And that's that's an interesting thing. And I, I mean, it ties into this other question. So I don't know if you want to just mention it's. Um, uh, thinking uh, about the role of, of reggaeton singers in the culture, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think this is incredibly important when you think about artists like Residente and um, Bad Bunny, uh, uh, Ricky Martin and others, and what they were able to do in terms of using their celebrity or deploying their celebrity um, to, um, you know, shift the way that people were thinking uh, about Ricardo uh, Rosello, uh in, in uh, Puerto Rico. Um, that was huge. Um, Bad Bunny has, is a different type of pop star than we've seen before. Somebody who maintains artistic credibility and commercial credibility and has been a political activist and an organizer on the ground. Um, he, I think he represents difference. And there are others who are, who are in that same uh, mold who are doing that kind of work. So um, I think it's fascinating to track this stuff and to see what... Uh, what a, cor a corollary to that point about reggaeton is... Uh, um, one of our uh, alumni from the uh, from the Becca Gabo program, Teresita Goyeneche, from Cartagena, wrote a very interesting article this year about a champeta performance in the Teatro Mejia, which is this uh, sort of Rococo. Um, I don't know if you saw it when you were in Cartagena, this sort of Rococo Zarzuela uh, theater. And the only way that a champeta group uh, called El Imperio was able to get in there was because this was during the time of pandemic. And there was a lot of opposition from uh, essentially the white community in Cartagena against Champeta, which is essentially a, uh, you know, a culture of poor, darker skinned uh, uh, people, uh, to having them come into the Teatro Mejia in the first place. They said, you know, the speakers are going to be too big. They're going to, uh, you know, destroy the inside of the theater and all the rest of it. But it was only because of the pandemic that they were actually able to get in there 
and then live stream their performance and get thousands and thousands of people into the center of Cartagena, which they ordinarily wouldn't have uh, have gone into. Um, we've got another question. I, we haven't yet gotten the hook, so I guess we'll keep uh, talking uh, from Nancy Buenaora, who asked, have you ever been marginalized by a media outlet because of your position or because of cultural activism? Um, I guess this is for you, Jason. Um, or you. <laughs> or me. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. You know, I've been uh, the the nature of being a writer is uh, being marginalized every single day. I mean, you have to, uh, you know, cult journalists have to fight for, um, uh, you know, for their pieces. They have to pitch them uh, all the time. Uh, there have been plenty of times um, that uh, I've had my opinions pushed back against me, often by. You know, let's say I've gone and done an investigative journalism piece and it hasn't come up with uh, the political line that the uh, uh, that the magazine wanted. For years ago, I can think I wrote a piece about Lori Berenson, who had been uh, sentenced to prison for, for life in Peru for uh, uh, having been accused of being a terrorist. And uh, I found out some information when I was down in Peru that didn't quite hew to the party line of the Nation magazine, uh, which published it. But... Um, the great thing then, and this was in the year 2000, is that the editor of The Nation was uh, a guy named Victor Novasky, who was fantastic. And he realized we're there, uh, that we exist in order to put forward even opinions that we don't necessarily uh, you want to believe or to put forward evidence that we didn't know existed. And he ran the piece uh, without any trouble. Now, did I have a piece published again in the nation? Well, yeah, 15 years later, you know, I got another piece published in the nation, but um, you know, that's the nature of the game. And you can't, uh, you know, again, going back to what we were talking about with Barry Weiss, I feel it's, uh, it doesn't make sense to whine. You just look for uh, another center if you've been marginalized. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I've never had an, I've never been outright canceled. <laughs> um, but again, I think part of the issue of cancel culture is that sometimes we don't know if we've been canceled. We just suddenly don't get the calls anymore from the publication that we were writing for, maybe because something we wrote angered an advertiser or upset somebody who um, has a relationship with a celebrity. Um, so that definitely happened to me at a publication I was writing for in, in the 2000s. Um, where I was critical of uh, an album that I was reviewing and the editor did not want me to be so critical of the album and went so far as to actually change some of the language and I pushed back against it. And I didn't write for that publication anymore because the um, editor had, had deemed it more important to maintain a relationship with the label, with the artist, um, than to maintain the integrity of, of the writing and, and their relationship with me. Um, but I think one of the things we have realized in this age of Me Too and Black Lives Matter and so on um, is all of the ways in which people have been canceled silently and um, all are only finding out now through investigation, through reporting. Um, I'm thinking about Janet Jackson, um, the great global pop star um, who had a wardrobe malfunction at the uh, Super Bowl a number of years ago. And uh, while performing with Justin Timberlake, um, and uh, she, uh, it was a it was a huge moment. It was a controversial moment, and she suffered a lot career wise. Um, she definitely came back, but never at the level that she she was before. And many people chalk this up to age, or they said, "Well, you know, she's in her forties, fifties. Um, women are may not be able to sustain their pop success." at that age in the way that they did before. So maybe that explains it. People try to come up with all kinds of rationale for it. But one of the things we learned um, is that Les Moonves, who was the head of CBS, um, when uh, the war wardrobe malfunction happened and um, when the television um, station got uh, sued, uh, and they had to pay a huge fine uh, for Janet Jackson's exposing of her breast on national TV, he decided that he was going to go out and cancel her career and he called people up and said, let's make sure that she never again is heard from in the way that she was before. And so that was a strategic and deliberate attempt to try to 
limit and to marginalize somebody in the music industry on the basis of something relatively arbitrary. And one of the things Me Too has shown is that that has happened so many times. So many people have been written off. So many journalists have been blacklisted. So many journalists have been canceled um, because of their viewpoints, because of the things that they've written. And we just never heard about it. It was all suppressed and there was no outlet to be able to talk about these things. And now there is. People are revealing you know, how the sausage is made. They're showing us um, you know, the structural issues that determine how people get to write, people's voices get out there or don't get out there. Yeah, I mean, what I'm hoping is that, uh, you know, there's certain political examples that we can all agree on. And but then when it comes down to uh, certain social things that matter to us, all of a sudden we're on the other side. I mean, in Colombia, you know, in Bogota, you know, those of you know that uh, uh, the entire uh, editorial staff of Samana uh, quit last month because of positions by the owners of the uh, uh, of the newspaper or closer to home in the United States, for those of you who keep wondering, why is it that Mitch McConnell and the Republican Senate have still uh, to acknowledge that Joe Biden won uh, the presidential election on November 3rd? It's because they're all afraid of being canceled by the by Trump supporters. And yet, you know, Sometimes we need to look at the mirror and, and turn that back to ourselves and say, OK, if we don't want to uh, if we want to bring common sense back into the argument, let's be, uh, uh, you know, let's ask these questions of ourselves at the same time. In any case, Jason, I think we're now uh, at the end of our uh, at the end of our time. So let me thank you very much. Let me also say to uh, um to the audience to invite you to stay for the next event, which is Contar Historias Ajenas, which is a conversation between the Ecuadorian uh, journalist Sabrina Duque and the Pulitzer Prize winning US writer Benjamin Moser, uh, the, who's the author of a controversial uh, biography of Susan Sontag. And I say controversial in only the best, in the best sense of the word, and that people should argue about it. Uh, but Meanwhile, thank you very much, Jason. I hope it's not another year before I see you again. But uh, on behalf of uh, Jason King in New York and myself in Rome, uh, buenas tardes, buenas noches, and goodbye. Thank you all very much. Gracias. Thank you, Jonathan.